Thank you, Jesus. So it's a beautiful Sunday today, amen? Uh, Colorado's bipolar weather, right? Snowing one day, sunny the next. I didn't know what to expect this morning when we got up. But God is good. Welcome everyone for coming out to church today. If it's your first time today, thank you. We welcome you. Uh, you're only a visitor once and then you're familia. Amen. We thank you, Jesus. So if you've been following with us along uh, during this series, last week we were in chapter 8. And in chapter 8, we were talking about how after everything God had done for them, Israel now is demanding a king again from Samuel. And if you were here last week, and if you don't have that, the video will be up on our YouTube page. But last week, we were talking about how the children of Israel, despite everything God had did to them, they began to say, we want a king, we want a king. In other words, their basis was, we want to be like other people. We want to be like the other kingdoms. We want to be just like them. And God was displeased by this. And so was Samuel. He was like, you know what? Remember what he told Samuel? He said, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me because they don't want me no more. They forgot that it's by my power that I've crushed armies for them. They forgot that it was by my power that I brought them out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. It's by my power that they have been successful and stayed alive. But the Lord, what, what do we talk about? Free will, right? The Lord says, if they want that, let them walk that way. But in God's grace, at the end of chapter 8, he gave Samuel a word to warn the people on what they were going to deal with with a king. And if you remember last week, we read through that whole list of what the king would do to them. The king would overtax them, take advantage of them, take their daughters away and make them work in the, castle, in, the, in the service of the temple and the castle for them. Take away the young men and send them out to war ahead of his chariots. They would become servants of the king. When before, all they had to do was work together as a family unit, be a free people, and then they were in service of the one true king. So God is giving them what they want. So now we go into chapter 9 today, which presents some very interesting things. And so Samuel has already given the warning. Okay, you want a king? You're going to get a king. But this is what's going to happen to you. And they still wanted a king. So God allows it. Going into verse 9, or chapter 9, I'm sorry, of 1 Samuel. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Ephiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. So let's, let's, let's look and analyze one thing about this. It starts off right away that there's a man of Benjamin, and it says that he's a wealthy man and a man of great power. Now, as you're going to begin to see this play out, what God is doing right here is he's teaching, and this is so relevant to us today, he is teaching us that what we want a lot of times is based off of our own eyes, what we see, what society tells us, that we're looking for something that lines up with the idea that we think, right? It, when we think of today, when we think of what a good wife should be, there's a certain model we have in our head, right? If you're a Latino male, you're thinking of your mama, right? You're like, they got to be like mama, if they don't cook beans as good as mama, it's a no-go, right? But we, we have a perfect idea of what we think a wife should be. We have a perfect idea of what we think a mom should be. We have a perfect idea of what a husband should be. We make up all kinds of ideas of what a pastor should be, of what this should be. And a lot of times, we're so wrong because all we're doing is putting our own emotions, we're putting our own thoughts, and we're building ourselves up something that we think should be the way it is. But God says, no, no, no. How do you know I don't have something different planned for you? And I'm going to show you the scripture verses that back that up in a minute. So right away, they have asked for a king. They've asked for everything to be this way. So what does God give them? Exactly what they want. It says that there was a Benjamite. There was this man, and he comes from a wealthy family. There you go. I'm sorry to say, but what do most parents say when they're trying to find a, a, a soulmate for their daughter or their son. A lot of people in their ignorance are only thinking of one thing, and it's the wrong thing to think. They say, oh, I hope my daughter marries into a wealthy family. I hope my son marries into a wealthy family. I hope they have. Let me ask you a question. When has money ever solved anybody's issues? Money is 
It's here today, it's gone tomorrow, it burns up. The Bible says, do not store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy, but instead store your treasures up in heaven. The prayer that we should be praying is, Lord, please let my daughter marry a man that loves Jesus. Please let my son marry a woman that loves Jesus. Amen? That's the key. And so right away we see that God is going to give them what they want. Now, in the beginning here, and we'll go over this in a minute, it says that there was a man of Benjamin. That says that he was of a tribe of Benjamin. So Samuel is being led by God right now to choose the king for Israel because they're asking for one. But right away there's a problem with Benjamin. Why? Because earlier in the Bible, as a matter of fact, it is in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10... This was way back in the beginning. It said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. From the very beginning, it was prophesied that the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that would die for all mankind would come from the tribe of Judah. So the minute you hear them talk about Benjamin, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, wrong tribe. That's not what God had. And of course, that really isn't what God had. But that's what the people wanted. Do you believe that God sometimes in his grace and his mercy, as a loving father that wants to teach us, if we keep barking for God to give us something and he keeps shutting it down and we keep saying, no, but we want it, we want it, God, we want it. At some point, God says, okay, I'm going to turn you over to have what you want. But now you will reap what you sow. You will eat of the fruit that you ask. And many times, even as Christians, we're chasing after things that God never intended us to have. As pastors, sometimes you're chasing after something that God didn't want you to do. And the Lord's first response is always, did you pray? Those of you that have been here throughout the journey, how much trouble has Israel got into over and over and over again because they don't pray and fast and ask God what to do before they do it? They get going and they're like, oh man, I'm excited. This has to be good. God's going to bless it. I'm just going to do it and then I'll talk to him later. No. We have to consult with God first. He's the king. He's the Lord. But what happens is, many times in our own desires, in our own excitement, we bypass God, we go and do something, and then we get mad at God later on and say, well, God, why did you do that? I was doing that for you. Why did you let me fall into that? Why did you? And God's sitting up there like, my child, I didn't do nothing. I simply allowed you to walk in your free will, and now have you eaten of that fruit? Now you have two, two, and I'm setting this up. Now you have two choices. You have a choice to be a David, or you have a choice to be a Saul. And as you go on, those of you that have never read these stories, this will become clear as we're barely getting into Saul. But I'll give you a spoiler alert. Saul did not walk in the ways of the Lord later on in his life. David, although he fell, always walked in humility and love the Lord with all of his heart. David, the name means beloved. Verse 2. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not one more handsome person among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So you see what God is setting up here. They asked for a king, so God's giving them exactly what man would want. Wealthy family, powerful family, well-known family. And this guy that was so handsome, he would fit any Hollywood role. He would probably be one of the most handsome models today if he was alive. He was tall. He was strong. He was good looking. Ladies, he wasn't just good looking. The Bible says that he was the most handsome in all of Israel. We're talking, this guy was so handsome that when you walked down the street, he was sure to turn heads, right? The ladies would be turning around like, wow. Very good looking guy. And so in the carnal thinking, what would we think? We think, wow, so this is exactly what we need. The man's good looking. We're proud of him to represent us. The man is strong. He looks like he could represent us in battle. The man comes from a powerful family. He knows how to carry himself. Wow, this guy has all the attributes of a king. According to who? According to us. It's kind of funny because he made mention here that his shoulders upward, 
he was taller than any of the people. He was taller than any of the people. Isn't that crazy? Well, it's kind of funny because later on, when Samuel goes to talk to the people, to the, the father of David, and when he goes and he's looking at the people there, what does he say? God, God has to speak to Samuel again because Samuel walks into the house of the father, right? And, he, and he's looking around and he's like, wow. He's like, surely there's somebody here. They're all good. And what did God tell Samuel? He's like, the one you're looking for is not here because David wasn't there. He was out in the field working. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that David was a ruddy, ruddy dude, right? Not real big like his brother's. And then God told Samuel something. God told Samuel that man sees things one way, but God sees things another way. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. That's what God told Samuel. And so right here, you can see that there's something going on that God's just giving them what they want, but it's not what he knows that they need. Okay? And it's, it, that's a very interesting thing. As a matter of fact, if, if you want reference to that, in 1 Samuel 16, 6, just go ahead and jump over there with me real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 6. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. He was speaking of Saul right here. This is later on down the road. For the Lord does not see man as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We, we want to look at things a certain way, but it's crazy because Samuel almost made the same mistake that was made by many before. Samuel was ready to look and, and pick someone based off their appearance and based how their stature looked. But God even reminded the prophet that, hey, you may be looking at one thing, but I'm looking at the heart. I'm looking for who's really going to serve me. I'm looking for a warrior that will be obedient. You know what's crazy is that in today's day and age, we can look at someone that we deem to be a strong follower of God. And they may do all the right things on the outside. They may dress the right way. They may, they may have all the right lingo down. They may be able to come into church and do amazing things and, and come up with amazing messages. But if their life isn't being lived for God behind closed doors, then what value of it really is to God? Amen. You're simply running a business. And we're not here at church to run a business. We're here to be filled by the Holy Spirit and move supernaturally so that we can go out there in a dark world and spread the light of Jesus. Amen? We don't want to be religious. We want to have relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords. If we do not pray and truly seek God's wisdom, then we ourselves can make the same mistake over and over again, just looking at the outside and not really understanding what's on the inside. People make that mistake when it comes to relationships. People make that mistake when it comes to friendships we always look at what people can give us and what they can do to us and if they fit the part that we think they should fit but I will tell you some of the most loyal people that will walk into your life some of the most beautiful people that will touch your life are people that you would have never given a second look if God wouldn't have led you if you weren't praying for it we're not talking about relationships today but I'll tell for anybody that's seeking a relationship don't be looking for the queen or the king of the parade because the, the float just might pass you by Pray to God for what he has for you because he knows what you need intimately. And God will supply that as long as you're faithful to him and you don't get unequally yoked. So, goes and finds this guy from a wealthy family. He's healthy. He's got everything. He is the ready out of the box king that everyone thinks they need. Verse 3. Now this is kind of funny. We go from talking about how handsome this dude is. And how powerful his family is to talking about a bunch of donkeys. That's a quick change of direction. Verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son, please take one of the servants with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not there. Then they passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. 
Now, there's something that's, un- that, that's equally interesting to look at here when we're talking about Saul. Now, like I said, as we're going to begin to read through this first part here, we're going to see that Saul started off right. We're going to see that Saul had some great attributes in the beginning. We're going to see that Saul kind of did all the right things in the beginning, but later on, as we go through this story, we're going to find out that Saul totally became a tyrant, totally let the power get to his head, totally changed from what he said he was, and as soon as he got a little bit of power, he, he turned into something completely different. Isn't that crazy how a lot of times we can walk in humility, but the minute God gives us a title or the minute people get riches, or the minute people get degrees, they begin to walk around looking down at other people, acting like they know better, or that they're more powerful. That's not not the way God intended it to be. God would have us that no matter what we have, and no matter what we do for a living, that we would still walk in love and humility, loving other people and showing respect. But Saul, his dad says, Go and find my donkeys, and Saul gets up and goes without a hitch. Now, to most people, you might say, okay, yeah, we just read that. What's so important about that? Think about this for a minute. Eli's sons, their dad was a priest. Their dad was supposed to be the priest of Israel. And even though they were raised in the temple, they still complained about everything. They were lazy. They didn't want to do the right thing. And they just wandered away. Even the prophet Samuel's sons did not do things the right way. They bribed people. Here you have a guy that was raised in a family that had all the money. He had all the looks. But you see something refreshing here in the beginning. His dad walked up to him and said, Saul, take a servant and go find my donkeys. If Saul would have been like some of the other ones, Saul would have said, Dad, We're rich. We have all kinds of servants. Send them to go get the donkeys. Why do I have to go? But you see the respect that Saul has for his father right here. That's a good thing and that's a bad thing later on. I'll explain why. Saul gets up and he goes, which is very admirable. His dad tells him to do something. He doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. He gets up and he goes and he begins to look for the donkeys. It says they looked everywhere. They couldn't find him. Verse 5. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become more worried about us. That right there is also very important because it shows that Saul cared about what his father thought. Saul was worried about his father. It wasn't that Saul was trying to make an excuse to quit looking. Saul said, Listen, We've been out looking for these donkeys all day. We haven't found nobody. He's like, we should probably just leave what we're doing right here and go home. I don't want my father to be worried about me that something happened to me. Once again, these were treacherous times. There was was people that would raid you, that would kidnap you, that would kill you. The roads were very dangerous in between these towns. He's like, I don't want my dad to worry about me. He was genuinely concerned about what his dad thought. I don't want my dad to worry about me. But as we're going to find later on, one of the parts that's truly troubling is that Saul cared so much about what his dad thought, his earthly dad, but he didn't give, he didn't give the respect to his heavenly father. Now, even if I say something and you don't understand what I'm saying, be patient. We're getting to it either today or in the next couple weeks. But Saul's earthly dad said, Saul, go find my donkeys. Yes, dad. But later on, we find out that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob told Saul, Saul, I need you to destroy all the Amalekites. And Saul didn't listen, and he hoarded stuff for himself. And he disobeyed his heavenly father. Let me make a quick remark there for everybody. You are to respect your parents. You are to respect your elders. You are to respect those that have been put in authority above you. However... It is never, ever supposed to be at the expense of disobeying God. God comes first. Let me tell you the danger and the positive part of this, right? This one's a double-edged sword. When you obey your parents, it brings great joy not only to your parents, but it, it brings great joy to God. But when you get to a point where 
You obey your parents all the time and you're so worried about what people think. Oh man, because this happens in church, does it not? Oh man, Dave, I don't want to stand up and say something about this subject. I don't want to speak these scriptures because I have family that will be offended. If I say this, my family won't want to hang out with me no more. If I preach this sermon or if I teach these scriptures or if I say this, then I have certain family members that do certain things in their life and they're going to be upset with me. You see, if you begin to get so worried about what everybody thinks then you're unwilling to execute what God has called us to do. And it is never a good idea to sacrifice obedience to God to please everybody else. So my advice is know your limitations. Be there for people. Help them. Be obedient. But make sure that your allegiance and your obedience, number one, is to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and his word. Amen? That's the most important thing. When it comes to our life and what benefits us here, we have great passion. And this is interesting. When it comes to what is going to benefit our pocketbook, when it comes to what's going to benefit us in our job or our future, we're really gung-ho about it, are we not? But when it comes to ministry, we always got to pray about it. We always need time. We always, right? Right? We always put God on the back burner. That's kind of what I'm saying is that you put God, number one, in your life. Always. In verse 6, he said to him, Now look, there is, a man, there is a city, a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely come to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. So the servant begins to speak of this man that he knows that can give them the word that can tell them where the donkeys are at, that can lead them in the right way. Now, listen very closely to verse 7, and that's where I want to make a very important point that we're going to stay on for a minute. The servant in verse 6 tells Saul, listen, we've been out all day, we've been looking, there's this, there's this man, he was speaking of the prophet Samuel. There's this man there, and in those days, before there was prophets, they called them seers, right? Now let me also, have, I have to explain this stuff for anybody that doesn't know. You might have heard the word seer before, but it's not the way it should be. Right? A lot of people will talk about seers as being psychics and medians today. That's a bunch of hogwash, man. That'll get you in trouble, and that is totally against the word of God. But before there was prophets, they referred to them loosely as seers, but underneath that, you'll notice in your Bible, it says that they were speaking of prophets, which they would be named later on. They were talking about Samuel. The servant says, we know this guy that he knows, every, he knows everything. He can tell us where it's at. Now check this out in verse 7. Then Saul said to his servant, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man would inquire of God, he spoke thus, come, Let us go see the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to the servant, Well, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. Now, that that, that should send up red flags for everybody right now, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. This was the guy that God had told Samuel, just go find this guy, he's coming, this is going to be who the next king of Israel is. And a lot of people right away off the get-go and reading this, they're like, well, why did God do that? They knew that he was a failure. They knew that he was a flaw. God did not do that. The people did that. God did not want Saul to be king. God was the king. Did God ever intend to give Israel king? He did, but it wasn't in the right timing. You see, during this whole time, There's this young man named David that's growing up that had the heart of God that God would have done things in the right timing and it would have been great. But because of man's ignorance, arrogance, and not wanting to have patience on God and look to him, God gave them exactly what they asked for and we find out it's pretty painful. Now what I find here very interesting is that the servant knew who God was. The servant knew who the prophet was. The servant knew the law. The servant said, I know this man. Saul didn't know who this guy was. 
Saul knew a lot about the latest hair care products. Saul knew a lot about keeping that physique beautiful. Saul, Saul knew a lot about the wealth of his family. But right here it shows us that Saul didn't really have a care for spiritual things. Well, Dave, what if, what if Saul just didn't know? There's no way that Saul couldn't have known who Samuel was. Samuel was the most, at this point in time, Samuel was a very well-known prophet through all of Israel, and everybody knew who Samuel was. You know how I know? Because when Samuel stood up and called everyone to come to him, they came. He was a man of authority and power. And the fact that Saul did not know who he was sets us up for something very interesting. You see, you can look a certain way, you can act a certain way in front of people, but God knows who we are behind closed doors. And who we really are comes from our heart. And if you truly are in your word and you love Jesus, then God will use you in a powerful way. But my friend, if you just are an acquaintance of God and you're like, yeah, I pray every Easter and I pray every uh, Christmas and I really don't follow God, then you got a problem. You're not going to walk in any power. You're not going to walk in any authority. You know what you're going to be? You're going to be more religious than relationship. You know what religion does? Religion kills people off. Religion makes people leave churches. Religion, religion is what causes people to sit in church and be like, oh man, this is so boring because you're coming for religion. But when you come knowing that the word is God and that when you speak it, it will never return void, you come to church a little different saying, Lord, thank you. As long as we hear your word, there's something that's going to come out of our life from this today. The servant knew who God was, but Saul didn't. So allow me to step away for a little bit. I said earlier, when it comes to our life and what benefits us, we show great passion. Now, I'm going to read it just right here as I have it written down because this was very important as I was reading and God began to share some stuff. We show great passion. When it comes to what God tells us, all of a sudden we become calculated and we have to pray about everything. Yes, you pray about it, but how many of you know people that have been praying about something for like six years and they've never acted on it? I'm going to pray about doing this for my family. I'm going to pray about taking my family to church. I'm going to pray about maybe having Bible studies. You can pray about it all you want to. At some point, you have to take action. Allow me to say this. A lot of people who profess to know Christ were more radical when they were in the world. There's a lot of people that when they were out there in the world going here and going there, they were so radical and they didn't care what anybody else thought of them and they were crazy about it. But as soon as they came to God, they got conservative, quiet, and boring. I got a problem with that. What are you talking about, Dave? Can you give me an example? Let me give you an example. Some of y'all know about this. Some of you guys know about this too because you did it too. I'm not the only one in here that was just a total heathen, right? What about the times that we would go stand out in line to go to the club Late at night when it was cold, and we would stand out in line for an hour, whether it's a club, whether it's a sporting event, whether it's, we'd stand out in line for an hour, and we would willingly stay up till three or four in the morning without one complaint, but yet we come to church and people are looking at their watches after one hour. Are we hungry for the word of God? Do we really want change, or do we just want to get tickled in our ears? Do we really want things to change in our life? Do we really want to see the power of God? Do we really want oppressive spirits removed? Or do we want to just come in here and just put on a little show and walk out there the same? Listen, if you're just coming in here and you're just like blah, 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 whatever out there and you're going out, man, you're just missing out on the whole reason why a lot of us serve God. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It would benefit me a lot more to not be a pastor in this church from a carnal mindset. I could be out there doing things in my old career, making more money. It would be, surely be a lot more peace for me and my family. Let me tell you what. Why do we do this? Because God is who he says he is, and God has great providence, and he has showed me and he has proven me. This, I, I want everyone to hear me real close with this one. I'm not here to convince you guys I'm not here to convince you guys to do anything. I'm not here to bribe you or talk you. I'm here to give testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for me. It's up to you what you do with your walk with God. I'm not responsible for your walk with God. I'm responsible for teaching what God has told me to teach. And then every Sunday when I leave this church, I say, Lord, detach me from this. It's, they're on their own now. All I am is a seed thrower. He's the master gardener. He's the one. The Holy Spirit waters it. 
I'm just a servant just like everybody else. I'm no one special. But we were so radical to go out and do other things, but yet we're so reserved for God. When God has desired us to live out loud. When it benefits our bank account, it's a sacrifice that we're willing to take. But when it comes to ministry, it's a sacrifice that we just cannot make. Why do we do that? I'm gonna be going, I, have, I have notes written every direction here. It was crazy. <laughs> Strong coffee this week, right? We can go to the Broncos game, Nuggets game, Avalanche game on a weekday, and we're okay about it, and we get up to go to work. But yet when I ask people, hey, man, how can we never see you or your kids at Wednesday night? Oh, brother, it's a weeknight, and I got to get up for work. Cool. I see where your allegiance stands. We'll just leave that one right there. The question is, where are we really at with God? Where are we really at with our sacrifice with God? Because most people talk about giving God a sacrifice of praise, but they won't even give a sacrifice of time. A lot of people talk about sacrifice, but what is sacrifice? It's when you step out of your comfort zone and you begin to do something for God, and you, it may be tiring. It may cause you a little bit of conflict. It might take you a little bit. It might be inconvenient, but how many of you know it was really inconvenient when God carried that cross and bled for me and you? That was inconvenient, but he did it because he loved us. Why do I say this right now? We live in a day and age where the world is going to hell in a handbasket and they are throwing stuff at our kids. They're throwing all these mindsets out there, a bunch of perverse, satanic garbage out there. And you know what? A lot of parents are sitting back and I'm sorry, but I'm going to say it and I'll put myself in that basket. I'm just as guilty as everyone else. Parents are to blame because we're not pushing our kids into places that are going to teach them the Bible, that are going to encourage them, that are going to help them grow. God, forgive us. The time for us to choose who we believe in and walk is coming. It's here. How does it relate? Saul doesn't argue with his dad to go out and find the donkeys. But like I said, later on he tells God, mm, nah, I want to do things my way. Power and money sometimes changes people. You guys know that? Power and money changes people. You know how many times I've seen people do this? And you guys could probably relate. How many times have you known somebody that was, I mean, there's, there's lots of different kinds of people that God created, right? There's pretty people, there's ugly people, and then there's pretty ugly people, right? <laughs> and God created everybody a little bit different. But how many times have you known someone that by, by human sight, people considered them an ugly duckling? Or... You, you might have known a guy that was like super scrawny or super fat or super something, and, and everyone would make fun of them. But when you would talk to them, you seen how beautiful their personality was. You were like, you guys are, man, you guys are amazing. You're loving. You're caring. But have you guys ever had some of those people that were ugly grow up to be beautiful? Have you ever known some of those small people that used to say, dude, I'm never going to bully people like that. I'm never going to treat people like that. Or some of the guys or, or gals that are bigger, and they're like, I will never treat anybody like that or make them feel down on themselves. But then they get super healthy themselves, and what happens? Their attitudes change. And all of a sudden, they begin to act like everyone else they said they were never going to act like. It's sad that many times in life, money or appearances could change us so quick. But if you stay in the word of God, God will keep you rooted to what's important in life. And that is walking in him and in humility because nobody is greater than anybody else. Am I right? right. Nobody's greater than anybody else. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. In Jesus Christ, we're all at the foot of the cross. We're all here to serve him and to bring him honor and glory. So they're walking around. And he says, let's go see this person. And Saul says, I got nothing to give. But notice the servant, like many other people in the Bible, the servant was a poor person, right? Saul came from great power. Saul came from a rich family. But Saul didn't have nothing to give him. But the poor guy, the poor guy said, hey, you know what? I got a little bit of money. It's not much, but it's all I have. I'll give it to him. Humility. You know, a lot of times humility is the foundation for God using you very powerfully. 
Humility is that, is that bottom ground level where God will build something powerful on it because God cannot build on pride. Anybody who steps into a church or a ministry or anything else and says, look, I've arrived. Now it's going to work great. You've set yourself up for failure because God always seeks out and looks for those that walk in humility, that want to be used, that want to humble themselves to him. Not those that walk in that think that they're all that in a bag of chips. Because none of us are. None of us are. Maybe some of you guys can, but how many of you guys, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you guys even struggle to look at the mirror sometimes? Not because of the way you look, maybe, but because you're disgusted with yourself. Because you know what you used to be. You know what has happened in your life. You know what you still continue. How many people struggle with that? And you know what's beautiful? Is that by God's grace, you can say, Jesus, I may see all of that. But Lord, obviously you died on the cross and you forgave me because you see something more special in me. You see, when someone sees someone who's a failure, God might see someone who's a leader. When someone sees a simple convict in jail, God might see the next great preacher. When someone sees someone who's broken and busted, God might see the next great evangelist in our country god does not see things how we see things and neither should you there's many people in here today that you're down on yourself you don't think that god can use you you don't think you're smart enough you don't think you have the right words and god says uh, moses did not have the right words moses had a stuttering problem he didn't need to worry about that because when you're rolling with the king of kings and lord of lords i will take care of that and the words that come out of your mouth will be so meaningful that even a pharaoh will have to listen to you but Dave, you don't understand. I don't have the right kind of family background. You don't need the right, fi- uh, right kind of family background. When you hit your knees and you said, Jesus Christ, please come into my life and forgive me for my sins. You were grafted into the vine. You are now part of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You have kings in your bloodline. God is who he says he is. So they went up to that hill to meet him, this man, Samuel. I'm going to go to 11, verse 11. And they went up the hill to the city. They met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is a seer here? And they answered them and said, Yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came to the city because there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited to eat will eat. Now, therefore, go up, for about this time you will find him. So they went up to the city, and as they were coming into the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them on his way to the high place. Very interesting. So they go up to the city. They ask these ladies where they happen to be there just at the right time. There's a difference between coincidence and providence. Coincidence is just a, a random thing happening that you have, you're just, and then you're like, it's just that. Providence is when God lines things up. Listen. His dad tells him to go find the donkeys. He's out there lost everywhere looking for donkeys. They can't figure it out. So what happens? The servant says, let's go see this man. As they begin to walk into this place, there just happens to be right at the right time, there is some women drawing water right at the right time. And they say, hey, do you know where the seer's at? And these women happen to know where the seer's at. And not only do they happen to know where the seer's at, they say, hey, wait a minute. He's just getting back. From a circuit, because what do we know about Samuel? Samuel went on a circuit throughout different towns, preaching, 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 right? The Torah, telling people about the ways of God, praying for them, giving prophetic words. And he was just on his way back in. They say, hey, you know what? As a matter of fact, Samuel's just coming back in. And and you know what? He's actually headed over to the temple like right now. The people are waiting to eat, and they refuse to eat until he comes and blesses it. So if you walk that way right now, you're going to run right into him. That's God's providence. You don't have to worry about it. God will line it up. Verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man 
from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people of Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So then Samuel saw Saul. The Lord said to him, There he is, the man whom I have spoke to you, the one who will reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you will eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go, and I will tell you all that is in your heart. So by, by God's direct providence, they run into each other, and Samuel says, go up, go up to the high place. When they say go up to the high place, during that time, it was customary that when they built their houses, they built a flat roof that was very strong, and they would put things up there on the roof because they would go up there and they would have meals with their family and they would reflect and they would talk and it was a, a great meeting place. So Samuel pretty much tells him, why don't you go on up to the family room and I'm going to bring the meal out for you. And as we read on right here, we, found, we find out that there was a special meal that was prepared for Saul already. Samuel was already awaiting him to come so he can welcome him the right way. In verse 21, as Samuel tells Saul what he's going to become, that he's going to be the next leader of God's armies, Saul answers this to God. Verse 21, And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you speak to me like this? Do you remember who else said that? Earlier in our studies, Gideon said the exact same thing. When they walked up to him and told him that he was going to be commander, that God was going to lift him up, he was like, dude, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. My family's not important. How can you call me to do this? And here Saul's doing the same thing. And this is where I want to go ahead and hang this up and end with this. Is that in the beginning, it would appear that Saul had everything, that he was doing everything right. In the beginning, it seemed like Saul, he was humble. He did what his dad said. He had all the right connections. But later on, we're going to see how that lifestyle of wealth, that lifestyle of praise, getting a lot of power, how that can change someone. Now, again, I don't want no one to raise their hand in here, but is, has anybody ever witnessed that in their life? Has anybody ever witnessed where someone gets power or money or something and they change completely right in front of your eyes? And you're like, dude, what, what happened? You used to be a certain way. You used to be loving, caring. You used to act. What's, what happened to you? Let me remind everybody, if Brother Russ would play something, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. A lot of people start strong in the Lord. And there's a reason why we do all these Bible studies. There's a reason why we go, why we're going through verses and through chapters. Because we can come up here and we can just give these crazy, hurrah, trust me, they're easy to put together. They're a lot easier than this. We could put together a hurrah message that would just be powerful, like a great motivational talk, where everyone would just be like, dude, that was freaking dope. It just got me all hyped up. It was the best. But see, the whole point is I'm not trying to get everyone hyped up. We're trying to get everyone closer to Jesus Christ. Because when you're closer to Jesus Christ and grounded, that's something that is tangible. That's something that you'll be able to fill in your life. What good does it do for me to build you up but not prepare you for war? You see, not teaching the word of God in detail, verse by verse, not teaching and praying and taking time with the Bible, not doing that is like me taking one of our young ones out of the crowd right now, giving them a sword and saying, go to battle, you're ready. The reason why we go through the word of God little by little and we dig and we mine out different things that are important is so that we can grow in the Lord, we can grow in his gifts, grow in his strength, in wisdom, and understanding. That way we can know the weapons of our warfare. We can understand scripture so that when the enemy comes against us, we can, we can quote scripture, we can pray, we know where to go in the Bible to be able to go against these things, and we will have victory in Jesus Christ. But a lot of times people come to church they get saved, they say a prayer, but no one's there to encourage them to open their Bible anymore. 
No one's there to walk with them step by step and say, listen, I know it's hard. Yes, this is very uh, hard to understand, this one right here, right? The text that we just read from today was one of those ones, Brother Leonard, that when I first read it the first time, I was just like, well, what do I say from this? So I had to read again. Then I had to read again. Then I had to read again. And then I found some people to glean off of, and I was like, ah, oh, now it's starting to make sense. The more you study it, God begins to reveal stuff to you. As we're going to find out, Saul started off right, but he lost his way. Why? Because he wasn't in relationship with God, and he allowed the things of this world to corrupt him. Let me just say this before we close today, is that a lot of times, time gets in the way. We don't want to read our Bible because we don't have time. Well, Dave, I can't really read that good. That's why I don't do it. Man, we live in a beautiful time, don't we? You can upload an app on your phone or get on YouTube, and it'll read you the Bible in any voice you want. It'll be a man's voice, a woman's voice. You could probably find the Bible read in Homer Simpson's voice. You can hear the Bible if you really want to. Okay? It's all there. But if we continue to neglect the Word of God, if we continue to just come to church and, and, and pick up crumbs and the whole rest of the week we're not opening our Bible and we're not active in the ministries that God has called us to do, then what we're doing is we are just setting aside our gifts on the shelf and we're not allowing God to move. And I'll tell you what, look around the world today. Does it look like we have much time to play around? I encourage you all to stay in your word. Don't neglect it. If anything has become an idol over, your, over the word of God, whether it's outdoors, whether it's uh, wrenching on your car, whether it's video games, whether it's sports, all that stuff is okay. I love all that stuff. But if it takes the place of God, then we got a problem. Put God first. Get those root beliefs inside of you because when it comes to the end, that's all that's really going to matter is who we are in Jesus and how close we are. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of the faith of some of these women, and I'm not patronizing them, I'm using them because of what they've said. When I, when I have heard Sister Gloria tell me, it don't matter, I'm not afraid, I'm ready. That's a blessing. There's no fear. The devil can't do nothing to her. She can get whatever she gets and she'll be like, whatever, I'm ready to go. When I see her, Sister Ermi say that, many of you guys that are newer here don't know the story. But just a couple years ago when COVID was at its peak and all this madness was going on, and my mom laid in a hospital bed and she couldn't breathe. And she called us and she was <gasps> gasping for air. You remember that? You guys remember those times, right? And they wouldn't let you go see your family. And they wouldn't let us go see my mom or even hug her or tell her that we love her. So she had to call us on a phone, not even being able to breathe. She couldn't even get a word out. And what would you expect from most people? I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm sick. But all I heard from that beautiful woman of God back there, all I heard from her was, this is right after the doctor got on a phone call with us. And they said to us, me, my brother, and my dad, they said, prepare yourselves. She ain't gonna make it. They said, you guys get your affairs in order. Your mom's not gonna live. She's very sick. She don't have an immune system. This has progressed really bad. We don't know what else to do. Prepare. So my brother began to prepare things that we didn't even want to prepare for. No one wants to prepare for this kind of stuff. But then they turned the phone back over to my mom. And I'll never forget this. Instead of screaming for help, instead of saying, help me, help me, help me, I'm scared, instead of doing that, my mom with no breath in her lungs Okay, son, my insurance papers are right here in this drawer. 
You go find them. You get them. She began to give me instructions on how to take care of everything for her because she was ready to go with Jesus. She gave me all the instructions on what to do. And then she said, don't worry about it. I'm ready to go with Jesus. I'm not afraid to die today. And I'll never forget how scared we were. We were freaked out, man. You guys all know in the Latino home, your mom is like, she's like, you know, she's your, she's, she's the one that always loves on you, that takes care of you. She's there to talk to. She's there. She makes the best food of anybody in the world, right? And to hear her not panic during that time really put into perspective to me what being a follower of Jesus Christ should really be at the end. She said, I'm not afraid to die. I'm ready to go. And she said, tell my grandkids I love them. That was it. Hung up the phone that night. We begin to pray God's will. At that time, there was medicines that the government did not want to give people because there was all kinds of dispute about different things. We begin to pray, and by God's great providence, my brother called and was able to get through to some people, and they were able to uh, administer uh, some stuff to my mother, and there was people praying all over Denver, all over the country, and by the second day of her, after they said that she was going to die, she began to make a full turnaround, and ever since, thank you, Jesus. And ever since that day, that woman has been more healthier than the rest of the family. But someday, I know God's going to call her home. Someday, God's going to call all your parents home. Someday, God's going to call me home. Someday, God's going to call you home. And some of us might go younger than others. What I'm saying is, it's not how you start your race. It's how you finish your race. Because you can start your race strong for Jesus and then let the cares of this world suck it dry out of you. You begin to worry about what people think about you. You begin to worry about money. You begin to get so bitter inside at what's going on that you forget to pray for your enemies. We get so vexed by everything and we forget that what does the Bible say? He said, come unto me all ye that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. That when we begin to feel heavy and overwhelmed and angry and all those feelings come back and the devil's attacking our health. Anybody in here the devil Devil attack your health come on now you know what I'm talking about and the devil begins to attack your health and your mental health and other things you can say Jesus I can't do it but you can Lord come to me take this burden off of me and help me it's not how you start it's how you finish and what's the proof with that you can start great for God and then you can go live for the world and walk away from God. You could blame God for everything bad that happened in your life. You could blame God because you never opened your Bible. You could blame God because of this or that. But this is something that we've had extensive, extensive experience with. Brother Leonard, Brother Rick, Brother Re those who are always here for funerals. Whenever somebody doesn't finish the race right, there's rarely a lot of people here to bury them. And it's only a matter of time before they forget about you. Why? Because if the only thing you have to your memory is how you partied, how you looked, how big your bank account was, that'll be forgotten. But I will tell you right now that people like Brother JR that passed away, people like Brother Tony Ortega that passed away, people like many that have passed away in this church will never be forgotten because the integrity and the walk that they walked in and they ended the right way. Young people, you want to know what real power looks like? 
It's not in muscles. It's not in anything else. Real power is when the devil can no longer take anything away from you and you don't care. Real power is when you say, take all my money, dude, it's okay. I'll still serve Jesus. Real power is take all my friends away. I'll still serve Jesus. Real power is take everything away and I'll still serve Jesus. Real power is when our brothers and sisters in Christ here that have dealt with stuff, when you can say, it's okay what the doctor says. I can't be defeated. You know why? I'm already living eternity. The devil can't stop me. You can take this tent away, but he can't stop what God's going to do in you. So before I pray for you to leave today, I want everyone to be encouraged and to know, no matter how you feel, no matter how, if you feel like you have failed, if you feel like the enemy is just bothering you, if you feel like you've done too much in life to ever make a difference for God, if you feel like you've gone down a road too far, if you feel all alone, if you feel beat up, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter what the devil throws at you in an instant the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could renew you, revitalize you, set you back up, use you to go out there and preach the gospel to touch other people. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't matter how old you are in here. Elders, we need you. We need your wisdom. We need your love. And God is still going to use you in a mighty way until the final breath leaves your body. I say in the name of Jesus Christ, use our elders to touch us all, to touch the young people, to show us what you have showed them, Lord. To everyone in here that's younger, you don't have to be a victim of the enemy. You don't have to walk around acting like everyone else acts like. You don't have to walk around doing what everyone else does. You don't have to get stuck living like that. God's looking for a few, just a few young people that will stand up and say, take my friends away. Make fun of me. I'll take that persecution. Let me be different. I don't have to walk like everybody else. But in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I will honor you all the days of my life. God can use you. We're getting to that story. We're almost there. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm just being honest with what the Holy Spirit's telling me. Teenagers that are in here right now. A lot of times, they say, how can God use me, man? I'm not as, I don't know as much of the Bible as other people. I'm not as good at this or that. Let me remind you that when Saul was still making mistakes, Samuel went looking for the one that God really wanted to be king. He walked into a battle tent. Oh, I can't wait to tell this story coming in a couple weeks. This one's going to be an easy one. There was a big tent there going on. All the children of Israel had gathered there, right? And there was this dude by the name of Goliath that was sitting there screaming out insults to Israel, making fun of them. And they went looking for the one that God wanted. He wasn't there. Where was he at? Little David was out tending the sheep. Everyone always asks, how come David wasn't in the tent with the rest of the soldiers? Because according to the laws of that time, you had to be 20 years and older to serve in the army. David was just a teenager. Check this out. Some of you older people might not like this too much, but I'm going to say it. God was calling a teenager to step up and slay the giant. Why? You want to know why? Because the older people lacked the faith and they didn't have the backbone to do it. Teenagers, God wants to use you right now. God wants to send you into battle right now. But you got to be willing to do it. Old people, God wants to use you right now, but you got to be willing to do it. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. All I want everyone to think about this week is, when your time finally comes, how do you want people to remember you? Ladies, your looks are fleeting. They're going to come and they're going to go. Men, looks are fleeting. They come and they go. But the word of the Lord inside of you can stay with your family forever and leave an impact. Let us remember who God is right now. 
as we begin, as we get ready to enter in two of the most important weeks of the year. Palm Sunday, remembering the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. And glorious Resurrection Sunday, when we remembered that even though we were sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ sent His Son to die for us. I am saying it right now with all the confidence in the world that there is many of you that are sitting in here that God is going to use to shake more people than I can ever imagine. There are warriors in here that are going to rise up and do something for God, but you got to be willing to do it. And we got to be willing to sacrifice. Amen? If everyone would please stand. You are all, you are all very important. You are all beautiful. You are all at a place where you can humble yourself and call out to God and ask him to forgive you. You are at a place to where, let me just say something right now, that this is part of a sermon down the road, but I'm going to give you something right now. When you wake up in the morning, and you're like, I can't read the Bible, I can't read the Bible. There's a mental block there. Every time I go to study the Bible, busyness hits me. Every time I try to do something for God, something happens. Every time. Does anybody deal with that? Every time something happens. Let me tell you something. There's something called oppressive spirits that are sent out to keep you from reading your Bible, to keep you from praying. What I want you to start doing is every time you begin to feel that depression, every time the distraction hits you, every time in your mind I want you to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I rebuke those oppressive spirits, God. Clear everything out that I may focus on you and have my time with you. In the name of Jesus, amen? Take your time to read the Bible. I believe that here in a couple weeks, we are going to see a harvest of souls that is going to be absolutely amazing for the honor and glory of God. Those of you who know how to, Will you join me in fasting and praying the next couple weeks that God's will be done during our resurrection service and that God would bring the right people here and that God would help people to come to know Him in the name of Jesus. Amen? Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father God, we humbly submit to you, Father God. Lord, none of us better than the other, Lord Jesus. Father God, everybody in this church has failed and fall short of your glory. Lord, everybody in this church has dropped the ball. Everybody in the church has had a moment where they haven't respected you or your things above the things of this world. But God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you begin to change hearts. I pray by your Holy Spirit that you begin to encourage us, Father God, at the importance, God, of walking with you, reading your word, praying, Lord Jesus. I ask that you keep our eyes open from deception, Lord God. I ask, God, that as all these lies begin to infiltrate and all the twisting of Scripture and everything that would come to distract people from the goal that we were called to do, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would focus us on the harvest, focus us on praying for our enemies, focus us on speaking the bold truth of God without remorse in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I ask you to be with all these amazing people today, Father. Cover them in your blood. Protect them. And be with them as they leave this place, but not your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We love you guys.